All right. Happy Friday, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Learning Tech Talks, where we explore the landscape of learning technology while cutting through the fluff to get the questions you need answered to build out your digital learning ecosystem. So today I'm taking a little bit of a break from the tech providers, and I'm doing the first practitioner episode. Um, and today I'm joined with Boss Debink, and we're talking about data privacy and ethics. Super exciting conversation. I know I'm excited about it. Some people might be like, eh, I'm not sure, but I think this is going to be a fun one. Boss, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks uh, for having me on the show, Chris. Yeah, perfect. Well, hey, like every other episode, we'll start it with a traditional training icebreaker. So we talked about this backstage, but I don't know the answer yet. So, boss, mm -hmm. why don't you tell me and everyone else uh, what is the most interesting place that you've traveled and why were you there? Uh, in September of 2017, I went on a safari to Kenya and Tanzania. So uh, it stops right there. That's the most interesting place I've ever been. Uh, I've been you know, to several places growing up in Europe and living in the U.S. But um, it's one of those bucket list things that I decided in February, I'm going to do it in 2017. And I booked the trip. And uh, it was an amazing experience, uh, clearly, you know, kicking a, a small Jeep and driving around uh, all the safaris and uh, all the parks that are out there, seeing all the animals that you expect to see. And uh, yeah, that, that, I don't think anything will beat that in the next couple of years. Okay. Okay. And when was this? 2017. September. 2017. Yeah. Okay. So just a couple yeah. of years ago. Yeah, time, for, time for my next uh, bucket list trip. Nah. <laughs> so what? What? Okay. See, now I have a follow-up question. Yeah. What would your next bucket list trip, bucket probably, list trip, be? I would say probably New Zealand and visit all the uh, Lord of the Rings sites. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, actually, you know, it's funny. I watch. Uh, I was watching. I've been watching Border Security. I think it's. I don't know. It's a show on Netflix. Um, and yeah, here data privacy, important stuff here. But they, there's so many people that go to New Zealand to see the Lord of the Rings yeah. sites. Actually, on the show, it's a pretty common common theme of people yeah. that they tag. So make sure you don't yeah. bring anything into the country that you're not supposed to bring, or you'll no, get tagged no. over there. It's always just me, myself, and I. <laughs> <laughs> Do you travel a lot? Uh, I, I try to. Um, haven't been doing it as much as I'd like, so that's why I said I just need to put a stake in the ground and say I'm going to do it this year, and, and okay. then I'll go. Yeah. How about you? Okay. It travel me? No. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I did I, it I, earlier. Uh, I did it earlier in my like career, that. and not only is I just I, is travels just not my thing, but the other part of it is the fact that I have five little kids, eight and under, so. Going to the grocery store is is my idea of travel. That's about the extent of travel um, that that I can do. So yeah, no. <laughs> um, but so let's let's start diving into this a little bit. And and one of the first things that I want to talk about is just defining what this stuff means. So we've said in the posts I've said leading up to this, we've talked about data privacy and and ethics, but. I'd love your take on what does that actually mean, uh, you know, for for me and and for anybody else. Yeah, and you know, it's it's been changing so much over the past few years. Uh, you know, data was always there uh, in in a very limited amount. Uh, in the past few years, I've seen seen and everybody's seen kind of an exponential rise in the amount of data that is being collected, that is being provided. And the challenges that come with it, you know, there were, I would say, five, six years ago, there were very few specific reg regulations uh, specifically targeted to data. And as you can see now with GDPR and, and some of the other countries and, and regions implementing similar laws that now it's become a, a very kind of separate kind of specialty and entity that now we have to be aware of. And from a, a privacy and ethics perspective, you know, in the past, you would enter your data wherever and it was gone. Now people are being given the option to say, no, you can't collect this particular piece of information about me. Or if you've already collected it, I want you to delete it. You know, it's one of the okay. we are, um, tenants that people have more control over where their data goes and, and what people do, uh, do with it. So uh, to me, it's, it's that entire discipline of collecting data, uh, what do you do with it, and how, you do, how do you dispose of the data, whether it's through uh, an internal record retention, 
or simply from a, a user, and whether that's a learner or someone who buys something on your website, if you know, I mean, if they request that that data be deleted, do you have that capability to do it in a, in a compliant way? Okay. So with that, and I know I've seen that just in in my career from an implementing big learning tech, right? The questions I get asked from mm -hmm. IT, the the policies that I have to have had to go through when implementing a new vendor, things like that. It has changed because of those capabilities. You know, I'm curious from the IT side of things, where does that, where do you see that responsibility falling? Is it, you know, what is the role that L and D plays in that versus IT versus mm -hmm. the vendor itself? Right. Well, I, I see IT as an enabler uh, always. Okay. So as a business function and learning and development being one of them, uh, they have to set the requirements and IT has to offer the capabilities to, to meet those requirements. Um, so as a learning and development leader or specialist or a stakeholder, you have to be aware that these laws exist and you have to make them part of your learning solution and learning strategy and collaboration with IT and whether that includes compliance or cybersecurity, uh, th th they all need to be involved in that learning strategy from the beginning. Uh, you, know, you don't want to start running into a solution and then finding out later that you did the wrong thing and now your CEO is in jail and you know, just doesn't look good on your performance plan. Um, yeah, I'm pretty yeah. sure it would look a lot worse than just a bad <laughs> performance plan. <laughs> right. Yeah, that did not meet expectations probably. But um, and again, I, I know those functions like a compliance or IT are, are sometimes seen, you know, as as a um, kind of a roadblock uh, or, or a break. I'd say in, in the best case. Uh, but they're not. I mean, they, they are there to help you and to, to make sure you're, you're doing the right thing. And you have to involve them from the start. Um, I, I, I hate to use the word agile because I think it's highly overused. And it's just a corporate a, buzzword. It's yes, you know, it's, it's common sense repackaged to, to make people take certifications and buy books and things like that. But the, the principle is, is good. You know, you start on a solution and you meet with the stakeholders at every step of the way and make sure that all your needs are being met, you know, whether it's again from a learning function or from a security function or a compliance function, all these people need to be aware at every step of the way, okay, this is what we need right now. First of all, does it meet your needs? And you know, we can have a whole separate discussion about translating between technology speak and business speak and right. vice versa. Um, but you know, focusing just on, on the data privacy and, and ethics aspects, need to make sure that Again, everybody's aligned from the from the start and, and have those conversations constantly. Well, and, you know, when you talk about that alignment and partnership, I, I can say that a lot of times, at least in my experience, there has been a, a little bit of a tension between IT and, and L&D, you know, mm -hmm. a little bit of healthy tension between us in terms of, like you said, IT can be perceived as a barrier. You know, it's in the way, it's slowing us down. We want to do these things. And why are they asking all these questions and <laughs> making us yeah, jump through yeah, all yeah. these hoops? Which, to some degree, and we talked about this before going live, 10 years ago, that, that may have been a little more true. And I think there are times where there's some things where... <sighs> 10 years ago, when you were looking to do something, there weren't the data privacy risks. And honestly, there weren't the regulations and potential implications of what you're doing. Right. That's a completely different world now mm -hmm. in terms of you go out and buy a, a tool, you're capturing a lot of data on people. And that, that's a different world than, well, I, I bought a new piece of software that we're using to create e-learning and it, it's not necessarily capturing learning data. How have you seen those kind of conversations, are you seeing, you know, with learning and development and, and just IT in general, that partnership evolving? Um, a, a little bit. And I've been on both sides of, of, of the house, you know, whether it's an IT function or a, a business function and you know, working in, com in commercial training, that's a oh, yeah. different animal. I mean, they see something shiny and they go for it. And then, you know, whether you're an, you know, if you're an IT person or a compliance person, like, Yes, it's, it's really cool and it probably will do what you need, but, but let's consider these aspects. Um, and, and that's, I think, where the challenge is. You know, you're an L&D professional. You're not a technology professional or a compliance professional or a cybersecurity professional unless you've had, you know, a, a very interesting kind of career roadmap. Um, 
So those conversations need to happen. And it's certainly more an awareness that these functions exist and that these concerns exist. So you can have those conversations. Uh, like you say, you know, 10 years ago, did not really exist. Uh, you know, IT spoke technology, the business function spoke business. There's very little interaction. Uh, you know, IT would deploy a solution to, you know, 10, 100,000 people and the business would go, what is this? Where did this come yeah. from? You know, why did we get this? Uh, I think that is that is improving, certainly. Um, you know, the fact that they're again, you know, looking at that project management, that there are user stories. You know, what is it that you're trying to accomplish? And then IT can say, okay, let us help you find the solutions. Don't go, don't go out and find the solution yourself. Um, because, you know, technology vendors even speak a different language. You know, the, the one favorite thing I always tell business partners is it's on the roadmap means no. So <laughs> just, just remember that, you know, it's, it's a different kind of, of doing business with, with technology vendors. And, um, yeah, you have some immediate needs. You have some long-term needs, you know, work with the business uh, strategy and make sure that you're, as a learning and development uh, specialist, you're aligned with, with the business strategy and make sure that flows through all the way again to the enabling functions like information technology and compliance. Okay, I, I love that. It's, that's gonna be the quote of the show. <laughs> it's on the roadmap means no. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to all the LED people listening, yeah, there you go. Now you know when you hear that, just be like, okay, so the and, answer to that is no. Uh, Right. <laughs> so what is, you talked about this a little bit, and I think this is something that can be a difficult area to know how to navigate as somebody who, because as I look at learning and development, there are a lot of people in learning and development who didn't come here because they were into technology. That's mm -hmm. not, it's not really what attracted people to learning and development. And that world's being changed that mm -hmm. now technology is such an integral part of learning and development you have to have some of that background and some of that you know ability to navigate that territory mm -hmm. if, if you're going to survive in this space what is your take though on the right balance because you mentioned it earlier it doesn't mean you need to be a compliance specialist or certified in cybersecurity mm -hmm. or able to program and code necessarily but at the same time I, I personally think it's a risk if you don't know enough and you're just handing it off to IT or compliance mm -hmm. and saying, hey, just, you know what, I don't deal with tech, you deal with it and just let me know, you know, when it's done. Yeah. Where's your where's your take on what is that right balance and what are some of the important things that maybe learning leaders should be more in tune with? Yeah. Um and, and it's across all business function. You know, when you look at, at HR with all the robotic process automation, you know, the conversation you had last week. Um, yeah. Technolo yeah, technology is 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 out there, um, and and it offers more and more capabilities. You know, but the questions you need to ask is, you know, even if you can do it, should you do it? Right. Uh, I think just that awareness uh, needs to be part of as as a learning and development specialist. Um, again, if if IT comes to you and say, hey we can do this, like, well, is that really something that we want to do? Uh, vice versa, you know, as a learning and development specialist or, or leader, um, no, you, you don't need to have a security certification or, or have a compliance certification, but, you know, again, you have to be aware that these functions exist to help you uh, achieve your objectives. So a, a basic knowledge is certainly very helpful. Um, the, the communication between those groups and, and the learning and development department is really what's going to make or break uh, your project or, or your effort or, or your strategy. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I, I've seen situations where, right, people get too far down the line without looping IT in or without partnering. Mm -hmm. And then they think they're at the finish line only to find out, oops. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Well, no. We got to start the whole thing over. Yeah. No. That, that's absolutely true. Uh, you know, as, as uh, an effort that I did uh, for a med, med device commercial training company was implementing a blended learning environment. You know, everybody's moving to virtual training or, yeah. or blended training, and you know, the, again, the vendor says, "Hey, we can do this and this and this, and give you some demos. Everything works great." 
then you implement it and then you find out or you're ready to implement it and you find out that your IT group uh, throttles video bandwidth, audio bandwidth, you know, you have to reach people who are on a 56K dial up, you know, and again, this is real live information, you know, people that are not in the US or in Europe or in heavily technology focused yep. uh, regions of the world, they may not have the same capabilities and you know, you'd know, rather find that out sooner than when you're ready to implement it and then you spent a bunch of your budget on something yeah right you get a call from a from a district manager or from a regional director and says hey none of my folks can can access your training because again uh, bandwidth capabilities or, or restrictions or, or or device restrictions yeah so with this and, and on this kind of the why why is it important for us to do this you know my personal experience has been that I understand why IT people a lot of times struggle with learning and development because we do, I won't, I won't, you know, stereotype all of us, but it's not uncommon for us to just, like you said, kind of get excited because we saw a new thing mm -hmm. and then we, we chase it and we're planning on bringing it in without really thinking through what are we trying to do? What are the implications of that? You know, how are we going to do all this stuff? So I can see from an IT standpoint, it can feel a little bit, I roll when learning and development comes mm -hmm. with another cool thing that they want to do. Yeah. My experience has been as I've grown in knowing more about the tech and spending a lot of time learning the tech, it is much easier to partner with IT when they recognize you are thinking very similar to the way they're thinking about things. And you've thought through some of these things. Is mm -hmm. that a fair statement? Yeah, I, I think so. And, it, and it's simply also, uh, or, or additionally, I would say it's the way training is being performed. You know, when you think you know, 10 years ago where classroom training was probably you know, 60, 70, 80 percent, I certainly don't, don't have the data. Um, I, IT didn't really have a stake in it. As training yeah. becomes more and more technical, now they, they uh, know that language. Um, and, and exactly like you said, you, you, you start to think the same way as they do or they start to think the same way as you do. At least there's some common ground now that you can discuss. And um, again, you know, don't start with the solution in mind. Just say this is what we need to do for the organization. You're part of the organization. We're trying to develop your organization as well. I don't know whether it's an individual team, the, the whole organization. Let's make this organization the best it can be. Yeah. And, and I need your help. You know, people yeah. love to sit here. I need your help. So that's. Uh, well, and I think there's opportunity for us to adopt some of the IT processes that really weren't necessarily learning and development processes, like requirements gathering, you know, right. really taking a formal process of documenting what are the requirements that we have, because that forces you to think, what are we trying to do? Yep. And then what requirements do we have to do that? That also, I think, helps help you move along figuring out, well, do we already have something or do we already have that capability Right. somewhere and it helps you as an IT professional say, well, wait a minute, we know about something else or something that we're working on that actually can accomplish those things. Right. Yes. Yeah, no, uh, that's that's absolutely true. Um, uh, on the flip side, and, you know, yeah. being devil's advocate, uh, <laughs> sometimes you have standards within IT and say, okay. hey, I, need, I need to do virtual training. Well, you know, this particular platform is the standard for the enterprise and it may not be the right solution for you know, commercial. Um, and but again, you need to have that discussion, and we need to ask, uh, get escalated to a leadership level and say, yes, we know this is the standard. However, these are Here's the requirements, why. these are the needs, and these are the business benefits. If we go with a different solution, uh, sometimes you're successful, sometimes you're not. Um, but it, it's it's a new discipline and a new kind of um, communication and, and discussion that that needs to start happening. And, and like you say, you know, the, the the requirements gathering, yes, it's some additional work up front, but it yes. will save you so much headache further down the path. So uh, you know, preparation should be eighty uh, percent of, of the project, and, and this should become a routine. Yeah. Well, I can certainly validate your statement there. And maybe sometimes that's right where it comes the first time you start doing things, or if you're new into the territory, it may be hard to believe, you know, we can hear you say, or hear me say, Hey, take the time on the front end, build mm -hmm. those partnerships, do it the right way. You won't regret it on the long end, but if you haven't done it, it's easy to say, yeah, right. You know, this is just a barrier, mm -hmm. but I I've been through it enough times to say, 
yeah, it's, it's true. Yeah. You will get to some point if you don't go through the right process and it will blow up and you will wish that you had <laughs> yeah, <laughs> taken the time to identify that sooner. Right, right. right. And, and you know, a similar case can be made for automating an existing process. So it's a, the, the lift and shift. Okay, I, I, I'm doing this currently and I want to automate it. And, you know, and I would say majority of cases, people don't look at the process to see if that can be improved. They just take an existing process, automate it. And, you know, it, it, if you're lucky, it works, but you still have the same inefficiencies as you, as you had before. So take that again, take that time ahead of time to look at your current process, whether it's manual or hybrid and say, OK, what are some of the opportunities that you know, we haven't looked at in the past five years before we put it into a uh, system or throw it up in a cloud and have people remote access it. Yeah. Well, and that's, that's true of automation. That's true of machine learning. It's a lot right. of these emerging technologies mm -hmm. where we've, we've gotten away for a long time with not necessarily going back and cleaning up some of our process or yeah. some of our data and things like that. And now you have these new emerging technologies that can look at it and speed up the process and analyze the data far faster. But mm -hmm. if you don't do that cleanup work, all you're gonna do is speed up bad process and make bad decisions that much faster. Right. Yeah, no, absolutely. And you know, to, to kind of get back to the topic, uh, in, in, yeah. the, in this automation piece, you know, you know, we started the conversation, all this data is now being gathered and with all these new capabilities, additional data is being gathered that, that hadn't been gathered before. And, and how do you make sure that you, know, you keep it safe and, and you, do, you do the right thing with that information? So before we dive into that one, because mm -hmm. I think that's where we're going to really go next is, is into what some of these emerging technologies are and how that data that we're capturing is changing. But before we do, mm -hmm. as your you know, any recommendations to learning and development people on, hey, because we do, we get hit up by a ton of vendors right. all the time, oh. asking questions, wanting mm -hmm. to talk. Are there some good questions that you know, we can just dig into that maybe don't require you to be a deep IT or data privacy specialist, mm -hmm. but at least help you start to vet through, hey, I need to at least validate some of this high level stuff mm -hmm. before even considering it. Because if I know it's just a no out of the gate, right? then then why not save some time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's kind of funny because the first question I would ask, like, what is your roadmap? You know, kind of I came back to you. It's on the roadmap, uh, okay. but it's good to know. Uh, at least you know you know ahead of time uh, as to what they're working on. Uh, I, I would say that you know one of the mo it really depends on the kind kind of organization that you work for. You know, is, is your solution scalable? You know, you may be looking for a solution for a, a particular group within within your organization. Well, that may be a great solution for the entire enterprise. However, can the solution handle? You know. The, amount of users, the amount of information. Um, uh, that, I would say that, that that should certainly be at the top of, of the list of questions you need to ask vendors. And, uh, you know, it's funny when I attended a conference, uh, I'd say three, four years ago, you know, these uh, vendors, I think out of the 60 vendors, I would say more than half offered their own LMS. You know, okay. I guess Alex. Yeah. And now, uh, you know, where are we now? You know, another example is, you know, five, four or five years ago, everybody was talking about the MOOC, you know, the massive online open community. Uh, now we've gotten back to more personalized uh, training. So the pendulum is kind of, you know, swinging back and forth on that kind of stuff. So again, from a from a business strategy perspective, know where your business is going and, and translate that information into the questions that you can ask the vendor. Uh, you know, here's where the business is going. Uh, here are my immediate needs, but for the long term, we need to make sure that we're aligned for that. Can your solution can your solution be with us every step of the way in this journey? Okay, so let me ask you. I love your take on this because I think your point is spot on in terms of thinking bigger than the immediate need, right? right. I think that's you know the takeaway from what you just said is think bigger than just well we're trying to reach this group of people for this right now, because going through that implementation and going through all this process for something and you haven't thought beyond that, or maybe there isn't a use case or it's not capable, mm -hmm. you may want to reconsider whether that's really the right path to go. But on the same time, on the same side, technology is changing so fast. And one of the things that I've seen 
as a bit of a tripping point for our industry in some regards is the whole concept of you, you buy this technology for life, right? You, you buy this technology for life and then you just hang on to it. That's shifting, right? Oh. That is shifting. I think, you know, I, I look at it as every three years, you really should be evaluating whether or not you have the right tech. How do you balance that? So you're not just going after things for short-term things, but at the same time, you're not looking at it as a, well, we bought this, now we're stuck with it for the next 20 years. Yeah, no, that, that's, a, that's a great point and a great question. I, I think it's very important to find a strategic partner in, in your vendor that, again, you know, can be with you every step of the way that has the capabilities to do what you need right now, but has you know, whether their, their internal expertise or you know, by acquisition, get more expertise in, in being and, and, and have them show that to you. Uh, and I know it's for, for startups, it's going to be a little more difficult. Yeah. But you know, show show the have them show you the history of how they've helped other companies in their uh, journey. Uh, will there be point solutions? Uh, I don't I don't think that you you can ever get away from that. And but by point solution, I mean, yes, you may have a platform strategy from a technology perspective. You know, big vendors, um, maybe multi-discipline functions. Uh, other than learning and development, but yeah, sometimes you will have specific needs for training in you know, compliance, commercial, manufacturing. Uh, and, and you may have really great companies that are very specialized in that in that particular area that you know right now they offer the best solution and hopefully ongoing they will do that. Uh, but be, be sure that your own internal environment and your organization is agile enough keep using that word again uh, <laughs> agile enough to, to 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 you know to to make the decisions yeah uh, like you said you know every three to four years things change i would say even more rapidly right now when you think about a technology perspective uh, uh talking about kind of a, a security uh theme here you know it's um, a password or, or biometrics you know it's, it's what you have what you know and what you are uh, you, know, you are your iris scan or your fingerprint. You you know your password or your PIN, and you have you know your bank pass or your phone. Well, now the mobile phone is all three. You know you, you have the phone, which with which you can access information to get access to your phone. You can have you know a scan, face scan, or a fingerprint, and you put in maybe a code. Well, five years ago, who would have thought that you know cell phones yeah. have all these three components? So. Yes, technology will continue to change at, at, a, at a pace that you know, we can't even imagine and things we haven't thought of yet will be there in three to five years. Um, again, make sure that you're, from an organization perspective uh, and also a technology perspective, that everybody can can uh, adjust quickly. Yeah. Well, and, and that's where it is. I don't think there's... And in and, and one of the posts, I said this, there's there's how many shades of gray with this, because oh, sure. it's not just a black and white, you do X, do Y, which is making this more difficult in terms of how do you do that? Right. Um, you know, Gary brought up a, a good question, and I'm, and I'm curious, you know, how you see this, because there is this whole, and I think, Gary, let me know if I'm, I'm not asking it correctly, but really this whole idea of proof of concept, because I think this is something that is important. And some of the things we've been talking about are once you validated the proof of concept, mm -hmm. now you're going to go big scale. That's where you start saying, all right, before we go here, let's, let's make sure we check all the boxes. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and you can, for the sake of buzzwords, avoid mm -hmm. being agile by throwing all that process and rigor into a proof of concept. And I yeah. think sometimes you can swing too far. You can say, well, we have to go through all these process every single time. Right. And now you never get the chance to innovate because mm -hmm. the time and energy it takes to go through that, you can't do it. So how do yeah. you balance that? Or how would you recommend that we balance that where we say, hey, and, and how do we have that conversation with IT to say, mm -hmm. this isn't a full scale thing. Right. We want to test it out to see if it's capable of scaling or if it truly achieves what we're trying to do. Yeah, and I think they understand that language, you know, to your point earlier, okay. I think we're more and more aligned from a business function or with it, uh, an L&D perspective and a technology perspective. Um, you know, I, 
I'm being positive and then kind of hopeful. That <laughs> all, these functions, all these functions exist to help the business move along. So uh, if they feel that whatever they're doing uh, can help the business be successful, um, you got maybe naive, but hopefully not. Uh, and then uh, again, it's it's our job to show that this is what we need to be successful. Here, it, we've we've done some of the work already. Here's a proof of concept. Again, we are not solutioning, hopefully, but again, from a requirements perspective, this is what we wanted to do. This is you know maybe a kind of a, what we wanted to look like. Uh, don't go f too far down the design path. It's a whole different kind of discipline, uh, whether you're in learning or, or in a technology right. or a vendor perspective. Um, but yeah, no proof of concept, uh, very important step, I would say. Um, still take your time, even if the proof of concept is approved. Don't go from that all the way into the final solution or make it enterprise wide. Go through the steps of making an, an iterative process and say, okay, we're doing this piece. Does it does it look what the proof of concept looked like? Okay. Yes. No. If yes, okay. Let's move on to the next piece. Uh, yeah. Make make sure you take your time in, in going through the implementation. Well, and what I've found that's worked well for me is, and this is my terminology for it, is I've always tried to create an incubator. That's what I call my proof of concept thing, mm -hmm. and that's where, from a data protection standpoint, I'm not putting learner data. I'm not doing some of this other stuff. It's truly just experimentation data. It's a low investment, low risk. Let's let's try this thing out and see if we can make it work. And if it does, then we'll start talking about how we carry that forward. And that doesn't require all the process and all the you know, assessment and stuff. As long as you're, like you said, keeping it small, not getting too invested in it and understanding that. And the reason I call it an incubator is because like some eggs will hatch and some won't. And right. you have to have that comfort with not everything you do a proof of concept in mm -hmm. is going to go somewhere. Yeah, no, no, that's absolutely true. And again, depending on kind of the training effort, make sure you've got the right people involved. You know, incubator is can be a little too isolated as well. But again, if you capture all these um, kind of additional requirements, whether it's data protection or compliance, at the beginning, you know, maybe you don't even want to continue uh, with a certain idea if immediately a, a, a concern is identified in in something that you're thinking about. Yeah. So let's so now let's jump into some of these immersive these technologies and how and why this data is changing because right. before we came live mm -hmm. we were talking about it and we should have hit live back then no, because now we're repeating ourselves but yeah. it's totally fine because one of the things I I brought up was this is a little bit of new territory especially for us in learning and development because historically the data we were capturing if we were capturing anything really was pretty limited. It was completion data, maybe some attendance data. We might have had some, you know, rubrics, probably not even digital rubrics. It was all probably printed out. And so that's what we were doing. So it was very low risk from a data standpoint. Yeah. No, nobody's, the hackers aren't out to steal my, you know, IT e learning completion data. Right. But that's changing <clears throat> as we move into this new immersive technologies. So I'd love to hear, you know, just from your side, what are, how is the data changing and what data are we capturing now that does make some of these new learning solutions more high risk to an organization or to an individual? Yeah, um, and uh, <clears throat> I think one of um, one of the, the, the responders to it you know, on LinkedIn made a great point with, you know, AR, VR becoming uh, more and more prevalent in training. You know, now you're capturing, uh, so, so thank you whoever posted that. That was a great addition to this topic. You're capturing people's haptic information, you know, and, and, and information that you know, three, four years ago, people didn't even think of as part of learning. Um, but, you know, when we think, and, and that's certainly, near future, I would say, even though you know, I've got my own thoughts about AR, VR and, and, and where it is. So let's say it's, it's, yeah. part, it's, it's part in neutral is kind of- But my, even voice, right? I mean, think yeah, about voice. Yeah, that yeah. that yeah. is now, and that is something that we are doing. Yeah, and and you know another thing you're doing, you know, when you work in a, uh, if you do training in a manufacturing environment, you know, authentication to a training system, I've, you know, I've seen it, it's done through uh, biometrics, you know, fingerprints, iris scans. Uh, okay, now, now we're talking about something different than a password. You know, if you get someone's password, uh, that's bad. If you get access to someone's fingerprint, now again, you know, when you think about the, the components of security, now you have information of, of what a person is, uh, you know, their fingerprint information, their, their iris scan infra information. Uh, now that protection becomes uh, even more important. 
and, and that exists now. Um, so, you know, again, it's, it's, it's a great topic to, uh, to explore further. And um, it, it makes the whole learning and development, information capturing and, and managing that information uh, a bit more challenging, but yeah. certainly more and more vital. Yeah. Well, and that's, that's what we were getting towards is, is thinking about that beyond just what information, and this is where I think upskilling ourselves in technology is helpful because you may not, if you're not thinking tech and data, you may not be, you may be thinking, oh, well, this is just a new thing app that's capturing their voice print and giving them feedback. Well, but think about what data that is now that's somebody's voice it's analyzing their voice that voice clip is being stored in a database somewhere you hear about you hear about scams all the time where people are calling you saying hey can I, they're just trying to get you to say the word yes so the compromise of mm -hmm. that voice print being breached carries far more significant implications than oh they got my you know corporate email address right yeah, no, that's and again, same thing with with fingerprint information and, and facial scan information. Yeah, it's, it, it opens up a whole different world because uh, now you have another piece of personal information that can give you access to that person's data, which you know, up to that point, they thought that you know, it's, it's really secure because nobody else has my face or nobody else has my fingerprint. But, you know, it is stored digitally somewhere uh, and can be um, utilized in, in, in not, not, not so great ways. Okay. Yeah. So, so with that, mm -hmm. how, and again, I think this goes back to that whole balancing act. Well, before we go into that, yeah. mm -hmm. right. Add to that complexity, right? So now you're capturing all this other data, this more personal data about people for things where you wouldn't necessarily historically have ever thought, Oh, I'm capturing personal, like you said, biometric data for training. That, that really wasn't a discussion that would have been happening five years ago, right. 10 years ago. Yeah. Add to that, most solutions and data stuff is now stored in the cloud, which I've seen organizations really struggle with making that transition and feeling comfortable with, okay, so now we don't even have our own secure data. This data is out there. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing that same kind of transition or challenge as organizations go through this? Oh, absolutely. You know, it's one thing to have your um, learners' information stored locally, where you know you have a limited number of people. Hopefully, you have access if your you know external firewalls are set up properly. But you know, the cloud is. Um, and one of my favorite memes is, you know, it's, uh, there is no cloud; it's just a computer somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> that, that information is stored somewhere that that people can get access to it. And and working with you know the big cloud providers. Um, you again. You, you don't have to be an expert in uh, you know, Amazon Web Services or whatever cloud solution you have, but you have to have that conversation with your, you know, information security or cybersecurity department, your compliance department. You know, who owns that relationship with a cloud provider? What happens to that data? You know, what happens in case uh, of breaches? Uh, you know, another development in the past, I would say, five years, is all these new regulations around data, you know, GDPR. You know, as a learner, I can request a company to get rid of my my learner data. Uh, yeah. Five years ago, like, you want to do what? You know, <laughs> but that didn't exist. But but now it, it carries some some pretty hefty fines if if you can't do that. Uh, that's an, that's an understatement. Ask, right? <laughs> you know, and then even ask uh, a learner for uh, permission to store that information. You know, yeah. In the past it was, hey, I need to do this training. I log in. I answer these questions. That's it. Uh, now there's these all these rules and regulations, and I'm not saying it's a bad thing. Uh, you know, we've we've seen the the impact of, of data breaches uh, pretty much every day. So uh, it, it's certainly good. But as a learning and development specialist or, or practitioner, you, you need to be aware of it. And, and you know, it's challenging because it changes all the time. And some countries have it. Some regions have it. Some don't. Uh, what if you do business with all those regions? You know, GDPR. You know, is the person an EU an EU citizen? Okay, if, if, are they actually located in the EU? Are the vendors that you do business with that may access your uh, learning management system or learning experience platform? Right. Are they based in the EU? You know, what information? Are the servers that? that are housing the data based? Yeah, in the, I mean, yeah. there are a lot of. 
you can, you can go down the rabbit hole very fast there. But and, and again, you don't need to be an expert, but you need to ask those questions from the people who, who do know the answers. And, and, well, and if anything, this is validating the point earlier that this is why it's so important to build a strong partnership with the people who are specializing in this, you know, and, and hopefully everybody watching this knows like we're, we're not, we're not saying this is how to handle GDPR or all this stuff, right? Absolutely not. Like, we'll make that big clarification right now because yeah, big disclaimer across the bottom, because this is, this is very complicated stuff. And honestly, from my perception, I don't even think the regulations have fully figured out how to regulate no. all of this. It's a little bit of a work in progress as we go. Yeah, no, and I mean, that's that's been the challenge with, you know, when you look at the compliance training, you know, the FDA doesn't tell you how to do something. You know, right. In the, in the regulations, it says you need to do this and then, you know, it gets interpreted a hundred different ways by an organization and say, you know, try to do the best thing. And then an auditor comes in and says, no, you didn't do it right. You should do it this way. I'm like, oh, why don't you tell me that? In, in your regulations, uh, you know, before we started down this path. Yeah. So, you know, it's 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 a constant adjustment. And uh, you know, I read something uh, when, when you look at a, at a higher education, you know, when uh, kind of adaptive learning, you know, kind of going back to the comment I made earlier, you know, this massive online courses, you know, you have universities that offer, you know, Stanford, you know, MIT, traditional, very just regular, traditional educational institutions. Now they offer courses online, okay, and, and maybe they uh, use the adaptive data to steer a learner down a certain path. Well, sh should, should it do that? Should there be some validation? You know, uh, maybe I'm not a good test taker. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm brilliant, but tests uh, are not my thing. But based on, you know, this, this path that's predefined and machine learning and artificial intelligence, I get kind of maybe uh, steered away from uh, opportunities that, that are not good. Um, and, and I think, you know, it's also something that, that you need to be aware of. Well, and that, and that's going to be a good transition into the next part of this, but I think kind of closing off the data yeah. privacy piece yeah. is just really thinking about, and I guess a good way to put it is the information architecture, right? right? Where is this stuff sitting and thinking mm -hmm. through the fact a lot of these solutions and you hinted at it earlier, it's not as black and white anymore. You know, the cloud is, is it's a computer somewhere. Right. It's just not a computer you own, but the provider you may be working with may be outsourcing that computer to someone else. So it may not even be their servers that the stuff is housed on. So you're not only asking what are their policies, but you're validating, well, what are the policies and things like that of where the data is actually housed? Because that may be owned by someone else. Yeah, no, no, that's a, that's a great point. You know, when you look at a, a vendor risk management, that, that becomes a, a huge concern with, uh, yeah, okay, I'm doing business with this vendor, but you know, what what do they outsource? You know, this kind of this now becomes from a third party becomes a fourth party, and and how do you control that? Yeah, and that's where you know compliance and cybersecurity become critical business partners to help you understand that relationship and the impact it has on on your business needs or or solution. Yeah. Well, and now <laughs> before we transition, the one thing I would say with this is that you know, we're kind of going doomsday prepper here. Right? <laughs> and it can feel a little bit like that, like, oh, yeah, there, no, there yeah, are terrible yeah. things and all this stuff. And it's so yeah. overcomplicated. And mm -hmm. the risk is that can push you to say, I'm just not going to do anything because mm -hmm. it just sounds too scary. It's yeah. too complicated. So you know what? I'm going to go back to the good old days. And right. we're just going to do the classroom stuff. We're not going to put anything on the cloud. Mm -hmm. We're going to stay away from tech because that's safe. And right. that's not what we're saying. Would you no, agree? Absolutely no, not. No, no. no. And, and actually, in that, that same uh, article about the, uh, the higher institutions, it's, you know, people are becoming so afraid of, of uh, what is it, um, overreach that they're, they're swinging back too far uh, the other way and then become underreach. You know, so now you're taking away opportunities from people because you're afraid to to do something. So again, you know, we've talked about it before. You know, what's what's that balance? And, and it's it's tough. Uh, you know, traditionally businesses had very siloed functions. Uh, you you can't have that anymore. You know, there needs to be a lot more collaboration. It doesn't mean need to uh, yeah. mean to say that everybody has to be an expert in everything. But there's got to be a lot more cross-functional collaboration for, for, for this to happen. Yeah. And with technology becoming uh, pretty pre prevalent in 
every aspect of, uh, of the business and, and our daily lives, uh, you, you can't get away from that anymore. And it shouldn't no. be scary. Uh, no, it shouldn't. You're using technology every day. You know, we're using technology now. You know, when, when people are not watching this, they're watching their phone. <laughs> uh, so um, it, it's what you're using. And again, yeah. you don't need to be an expert to use a cell phone. So hopefully whatever solutions that the vendors come up with, it, it should become as easy as you know using your, your, your cell phone or stepping in your car and driving. Yeah. Uh, and that, you know, because same with, with uh, AR and VR and, and any of the newer technologies that, that are going to have an impact on learning. Well, and that's why, you know, for me personally is, is I'm so passionate about helping bring learning and development into this digital age because it is it can feel scary until you get into it and you start making those partnerships and you start upscaling yourself in some of these things, not to become an expert, but to know enough to say, yeah, it's a little bit of uncharted territory, but it's navigatable and the end goal is worth is worth navigating that mm -hmm. path. So so yeah. let's keep moving forward. Let's just do it carefully. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, on, on the learning uh, development side, you know, as an instructional designer, you, you, you use technology to create your courses. And yes, it, it'll change. And yes, you'll have to reskill yourself to keep up with that. Uh, on the development side, I think that's where some of the major challenges are, you know, from a traditional tra uh, classroom training to all these new ways of, of training people, whether it's through mobile or um, just in time, virtual training, uh, blended training. So I think that's where some of the catch up uh, still needs to happen. Yeah. So let's, let's jump over to the ethics side of this, yeah. because this is one that I am extremely fascinated and, and passionate about is we're capturing all this data. There is all this skepticism around it. Um, not only with the, well, this stuff is outside of our organizations, but there's even healthy skepticism inside the organization. Sure. Let's talk about data ethics and some of the implications. Let's first define what we mean when we say data ethics. Mm -hmm. So I'd love your, I'd love your elevator definition of oh, what, what yeah. is data ethics. Oh, now you're doing, putting me on the spot. I am. I'm yeah, putting yeah. you on the spot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you said you do Renaissance stuff or you did. So yeah. I, you're, you're good with it. Yeah, no, no, that's fine. Uh, you know, it, it's doing the right thing. Uh, it, it's as simple as that, you know, and then it, it, way back when uh, I wrote this article on, a, on an internal company website, it was called, you know, what would your mother say? And it was, you know, it's like when you when you type an email and you send it, you know, if, you, if your mother saw it, what, what, would, she, what would she say? Uh, and that's kind of, kind of the standard that I said, you know, from an ethics perspective, and again, I'm, Grossly over oversimplifying things, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it, it, you know, and, and again, it's it, it should be coming from the top, and you know, kind of steering away, from, you know, kind of avoiding your question as to defining it. Um, but it needs to be prevalent throughout the organization. Again, if it doesn't start at the top, you know, how can you expect it to, to happen at the bottom? Um, but yeah, from a from a more pragmatical perspective, you know, what do you do with the data? Do you sell the data? Uh, who do you sell it to? Uh, why do you need this particular piece of information about your learner or you know, whoever the, the, the person on the receiving end is? Um, these are the questions that, that you need to ask and you know, kind of make a determination and uh, have specific decision points as to say, okay, well, maybe we don't need that information. Or if we do, uh, what do we do with it? How do we yeah. use it? Can we uh, normalize it? Uh, you know, kind of the example that I gave, if, uh, you know, if you're taking an online course and you, based on some kind of algorithm, you're being steered in a certain direction. Okay, now let's, let's, let's apply that to a, to a corporation and say, okay, now you have an employee taking some training, take some tests. Uh, well, based on their results, they're not manager material. So we're gonna yep. move into, into a technical track. Uh, now, we're, now we're talking ethics, you know. Um, what what kind of impact does it have on a, on a person's you know, life, career, uh, reputation, uh, things of that nature? Yeah, well, and and that's I like you've you've had there's a couple quotes now that mm -hmm. I think I'm probably going to steal from you. You okay. know, so the data ethics is would my mother be okay with this? <laughs> I think that's a great one. There, that there you go, everybody. Use that as your use that as your baseline. But I think that's it's a very important thing for us to consider as we do this. And one of the things you hit on there that I think is completely valid in making sure people think about this is 
and I guess this is my my best practice is let's capture the least amount of data required, right? Let's let's think about what we need and let's not just because I think in some cases the the practice has been let's just get as much as we can and we'll figure out later what we're going to do with it. And that's where you open yourself up to risk because mm -hmm. now you're saying, "Whoa, you can't even pass the red face test of why do you have this data? What are you doing with it? And now it gets breached and you have to answer, well, like, why were you holding on to that? And what were you doing with it in the first place? Right. Versus if you're very intentional about, well, this is the data we're going to capture. Here's why. Here's what we're going to do with it. That's a very different situation. Is that a fair, is that a fair yeah, approach? No, that, that's absolutely true. And I think you mentioned it before from a data architecture perspective, you know, as you're building these solutions and collect the requirements, that becomes a, a vital piece of that entire um, re requirements document, the data architecture. You know, what are you capturing? Where is it going? What do you do with it? You know, who are the partners that you may be dealing with that could have access to that information? So no, I absolutely agree. Yeah. Well, and, and the other piece that I think is important with this, that I think we could all do a better job, this isn't just learning and development, is from an ethical standpoint, I think some of the hesitation that you see from end users is the lack of transparency into what the story being told of, hey, here's what we're, here's what's being done with your data. And I think sometimes people are a little nervous to share that, but I think that helps bring people and put people at ease to say, Hey, listen. Here's here's what you're giving us. Here's the data that we're capturing. Here's why we're capturing it, and mm -hmm. here's how we're planning on using it. Hopefully, the answer to that is to help you with X, Y, Z. Like these are the outcomes we're driving to, and here's how your data is going to help us best help you get there. Yeah. No, that's a great point, and and you know you want to try and avoid that being enforced at a government level. You know, but, but with rules and regulations like yeah. know, GDPR. You have to have those messages before people enter information. Oh, again, what am I collecting? What am I doing it with it? What are your rights as a consumer of, or a provider of that information? Uh, I, I, you, you want to try and get rid of, uh, get away from that. So, from a from a company kind of corporation perspective, or even a, a learning institution perspective, um, you have to be prepared to present the learner with that information and. Again, you know, learning analytics is uh, is becoming more and more prevalent, and it's great because now you have a lot of data that you previously didn't have that can hopefully help as a learning and development uh, professional uh, help help you in your job. But again, you don't have to make sure that no personal information is being used to come to conclusions when you can try and normalize that information and uh, make it more anonymous. Uh, data, data is great; uh, you, can, you can do a lot with it. Uh, it can help uh, you become a better person and what you're doing can help the, help, help the business, can help your function. But you have to have very clear and uh, transparent, like you said, rules and, and how, how, how you plan to use that data and show the outcomes. Like, hey, look, we did this exercise, you know, we did this training. This is the information that we gathered that was completely anonymous. And he, he, here's how it helps, you know, maybe make a better version of the training. Uh, reach more people, um, things, that, uh, information that we didn't have access to a few years ago. Yeah. Well, and and with these, with these, <laughs> with this stuff, I think one of the challenges with data that sometimes makes people a little uncomfortable is sometimes it shows us the not so pretty things about the way we do things or the practices that we have or the tendencies that we you know tend to operate against right. because it's simply capturing what's happening. Right. It's yeah. just capturing what's happening. And so when some of this stuff comes out and people go, wow, wow, that was so biased or this was so terrible. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, all it's doing is telling you what's happening yeah. in the organization. And sometimes that makes us a little uncomfortable, which where that ethical piece comes in where you, mm -hmm. it gives us a chance to look at it and say, we don't like that. What can we do to change it? But we have to have that ethical guidance along the way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And, um, you know, when we talk about machine learning and artificial intelligence, it's certainly not perfect. Uh, and it will be for a while. Uh, you know, when you think about collecting and, and managing data, it's only as good as the algorithms that were put into the system. So you should, uh, until you've done enough validation, you should always have some kind of checkpoints and say, okay, here's what the data says. Here's what we know 
is the truth and and let's see where the gaps are and see you know which way we're going to swing from a a final solution perspective you know it's never black and white and we talked about that before there's a lot of yep. great areas um but again uh, data is being spit out by by a uh, by a stupid machine uh, again all it does is taking what you put in and and whatever someone else programmed it to do right and giving it back to you uh it, it doesn't necessarily have or maybe not yet have critical the experience thought. that you as, as, a, you know, as a learning and development leader have you know they say hey you know this based on this data um we recommend classroom training and it, you may know like well based on the geographic location and uh, other challenges right yes but no well and that goes back to see now this could be a whole nother episode right but that goes back to one of the challenges with machine learning is the black box where yeah. we don't necessarily see into how those decisions are being made it goes in and it comes out and like you said yes part of it is how good is that algorithm the other part is how good is the data set that it's making its decisions off of. If you've got a really biased or corrupt data set, you can send the best algorithm at it, but the decisions it makes or the conclusions it draws may not be good, which is where that human in the loop comes in. Yeah, no, that's that's a, that's a great point. You know, it's garbage in, garbage out. You know, no matter what you, uh, how, how good, like you said, your algorithm or your system is, you have to make sure that your data is is clean, it's, it's accurate. Uh, but again, you don't know that. So the good thing is, even if you get garbage out, you say like, "Why is this garbage? Why is this garbage?" <laughs> right? And okay, the solution is working out. So okay, so what is it that we're putting in, and or why are we putting it in this way? Well, we've you know, we've always done it for the past you know five years. This is the information that we gathered and made our decisions based on that. Well, maybe that needs examining, uh, and you know, it kind of goes back to the to the converse. The, the, topic I mentioned before, you know, the lift and shift, you know, you take something that you've been doing for a long time, throw it into an automated solution, well, may not get the results that you expect. So again, take that time to look at what it is that you're currently doing, make sure that's actually accurate and, and reflecting real life or reflecting the strategy that you're trying to accomplish, and, and then throw it into an automated solution. Yeah. Well, you know, we're coming up at the top of the hour. I told you, I told you, we were going to run out of time before we ran out of things to talk about because I feel like we've just cracked the surface on this stuff and, and we could go much deeper. But I really appreciate you being here. You know, Oz, it's been great getting to know you over the last, you know, bit here. And, um, you know, I think the three big takeaways that, that I'm walking away with, and, and you, I'll give you a sec to do yours, but the three big ones that I see is, you know, really building that partnership and thinking with the desired end in mind, right? And building that partnership with IT, you know, making sure that as you're going through this, you're just upskilling yourself and better understanding what these things are. Not that you need to be an expert, but that you can really start to understand what's going on. So you can ask the right questions and do some of this stuff on the front end instead of just outsourcing it. And the last piece is, as we move into these new and emerging technologies and are doing more things with data, that we don't lose sight of keeping our critical thought and the thing that makes us uniquely human still in the loop, because that is so important to look at that and make sure we're looking at it and putting our critical thinking and human element on top of that. Anything yeah. you would add to that? Uh, no, just make sure that these rules and regulations change on a, on a, on a dime. Yeah make sure that you're you're flexible enough to to adapt to the rules and regulations and preferably be ahead of the game uh you, you again being being positive here <laughs> you, you know you know what it is that you have to do to, to do the right thing you don't have to tell a, a an institute you know government institute or some kind of regulatory agency to give you rules and regulations you know if uh, preferably you would have a regulatory agent come in and say you know you guys you're in great shape. We don't have to do anything, you know, or rules and regulations change and you can go to your leadership. You know what? We, we don't need to change anything in the way we're doing. We're already doing it. Um, so again, you know, and it, and it requires, like you said, a lot of collaboration with compliance, security, IT, uh, have those conversations and, and make sure that um, they know that you're also in it for them. You know, they yeah. need to be trained. They need to be upskilled. Yeah. They we need to bring them along for the ride, right? Yeah, we can right. learn from them and upskill ourselves, and we can upskill them 
alongside us. I think that's a great, great final piece. All right. Well, thank you again, boss, for being here. Thanks everybody for tuning in and watching those of you listening. Thanks for listening. Be sure to like, share, comment, uh, you know, let us know what you think so that we can continue to improve things. Uh, and thanks everybody. Have a great weekend and we'll look forward to talking to you next week. All right. Thanks all. Thanks.